Hi, my name is Carlos Ruiz from the INRF and today we'll be talking about our Tryon etching system. Our Tryon system is both an IRE and an ICP and it provides flooring based etching gases. So here you'll find the overview of our system. We have a control panel here, we have our login so you can get build, and we have a two chamber system, one here where we load lock and here is the reactor chamber. But before we start loading our sample and showing you how to use the tool, we gotta go over a couple of safety things. First, you'll see this sign. This sign, whenever you see it, whether it's on this side or this side, means the tool should not be operated before checking some things in the chase. So, a do not operate is a little more vague. A CDO is a more specific message. You may be wondering, what's a CDO? Well, CDO, or Controlled Decomposition and Oxidation, is just a burn box that takes leftover chemicals that are not used during a reaction and burns them with oxygen in a high temperature. Then this is released to the atmosphere so that Whenever we have chemicals that need to be expelled into the atmosphere, it will be more inert and less reactive. It's better for the environment and for safety. So it's important to make sure that tool is running in the background before we start using this tool because we don't want to pump any gases through and directly into the atmosphere. Down here, you'll see a frequency. This frequency refers to our turbo pump. So right now it is operating at 833 hertz, which is the normal operating frequency. If you forget what it is, it's written up here. So this should be this number. If it's, if it's different, let's say 500 or 1000 or anything drastically different, you should inform staff before using the tool. It's normal for it to fluctuate by one or two digits. Right above it, we have a couple of emergency controls. We have the EMO, which is an emergency shutoff. If you hit this, the tool will shut off. So in the case of a big emergency, a fire, an earthquake, and you have to shut off the tool, hit the button. We also have a red off button and a couple of other tools here that are not really used or intended for regular users. So in a few moments we'll be going back and chase and we're going to talk about some of the gases and the CDO box that we mentioned earlier. So we're coming out of a try-on room which is right here located in room 2339 and right next door is our chase in room 2343. So I'll join you in a moment. Before we begin processing our sample, we need to check a couple of things here in the chase. To my right are two pumps. This pump is responsible for our process chamber. The pump below it is responsible for our load lock. You want to make sure both these pumps are turned on and active. To tell, you put your hands near the pump and you're going to feel a lot of heat and vibration. Be careful not to burn your fingers, it's pretty hot. Over here, we also like you to examine the oil level. The oil level should be within spec and that means the pump is good to go. Behind the pumps, you'll find the chill water supply. This chill water supplies chill water to our RF network and also our process chamber. It is generally set around 18C. It can fluctuate a couple of C and that's fine. Next we check the gas lines. A couple of gas lines you'll need to run the tool. We have oxygen and nitrogen gas that need to be turned on. Usually we turn them on here. However, we don't like regular users to turn them on. We prefer staff do it. So if you see a tag like this, that means the gas is not on. You want to go find staff and they'll turn it on for you. When it's turned on, you'll see an in-use tag just like this. And back here, we have another cylinder. This one is helium. We need this for the backside cooling of our sample. So this has to be turned on as well. And finally, to the left here, we have two more gases. We have our fluorine gases. We have CF4 and SF6, both used for different processing. And they both share what is called a bellows valve, which means only one of these gases can be turned on at once. So if your process requires one gas and the line is charged with another gas, you'll need to purge the line right here and recharge it with the gas you want to use. To test for this, you want to go check the logbook and see who, who ran what last and then you'll know what gas is currently in the line. To change the line, please ask staff. We'll be happy to help you do that. And it takes only a few minutes, so just let us know ahead of time if you need to start your process and we'll have it all ready for you. The last thing you want to check is our CDO, which is right here. Our CDO's condition is indicated by the lights here, which should all be green. If you see any of these red lights lit up, something failed, and that could be a number of things. So this is based off conditions on the temperature and also the flow of fluids and gases. Here you'll see the temperature of the CDO. It must be between the range of these two notches. Right now you see it's right there and right in the middle, so it's good. That means our temperature passes. And on the left, you see a couple of little beads flowing up. This indicates the levels of our oxygen, nitrogen, and water. These are all set by the staff, so please don't edit these or mess with them. If you need help, of course, inform the staff. If these seem to be a little skewed, again, just tell the staff. We'll be happy to help you out. So assuming everything is green and good to go, you are ready to run your process. Welcome back. So now that we've returned from the chase and made sure that all the gases and the pumps and everything is operational back there, we're ready to start using the tool. So to load a wafer, 
First, we want to make sure that there's no wafer already loaded. Sometimes the tool, even though it's supposed to indicate when the wafer is loaded or not, may have wafer in there. So you want to just briefly peek into the chamber with a flashlight. It's hard to show on the camera, but I'm just going to demonstrate how you would do it. You get a flashlight, there's a window here that you can poke and look in there to see if the wafer is loaded. So just check there, make sure there's no wafer. We already checked, so there's no wafer right now, but that's how you would check. You have a flashlight like this available at the front office or just laying around, you might find one. So once we know that there's no sample already loaded, we can load our sample. So to do that, we click load wafer on the screen. It will ask you, do you wish to vent the load lock? So by vent, it means it's going to push in ox put, uh, nitrogen in here to allow you to open the vent. So yes, you want to vent it. You're going to hear some noises. It takes about half a minute. And then this will slowly come up to atmospheric pressure. So once our chamber has vented, we can now begin to load our sample. We open this hatch. And here we have the reactive arm with a space for our sample. To load a sample, you simply use your tongs and you can put it in. Now, technically it doesn't matter how you orient the sample, as long as it's touching this little flat. However, for our benchmarks and for our studies, we prefer the flat to be facing this way, toward the chamber. So once it's situated there, we close the hatch. And on the screen, we confirm that the wafer is on our end efficator and hit OK. Now this chamber, the load lock, will begin to pump down to a near vacuum. We do this because we're going to put this in the chamber with our turbo pump running. Our turbo pump is running in the vacuum and if we were to introduce atmospheric pressure to our turbo pump, the turbines inside will be damaged by the sudden inflow of air. So it's very important that the load lock is pumped down to a similar pressure as the one already in the chamber. Now what you're going to see here is, once the chamber is pumped down, this reactor door up ahead will open and this arm is going to push our sample inside. Once inside, pins from the bottom are going to stick the sample up and allow the arm to pull out. Then the reactor door will close behind it. Now, at this point, the sample is suspended by pins inside the reactor chamber. The pins will next lower and the sample will be touching the electrostatic chuck. This will allow the sample to be stationary and also provides it helium cooling on the back side. So now our arm returns and everything I just described to you is happening on the inside. Unfortunately we can't show it in video but you're going to see some pretty cool stuff on the screen in a moment. So now that we've loaded our sample, we now have a green light here next to our wafer loaded signal. Now this signal does not always turn on. Sometimes a wafer can be inside the chamber and the light will not be green. So if you begin to load a sample while a sample is already inside, you're going to have a crash in the samples which can be very catastrophic for your run and also for the tool. To begin running the process, first you want to load a recipe. Under the top recipe control, you see a load edit recipe button. Click that and you see recipe parameters. Now this happens to be auto click which you want to run, but if you want to run a different recipe, what you do is click on recipe from disk and now you have a, a big series of recipes to pick from. Generally speaking, we only have about two or three most commonly recipes and the other ones are just variations on the process time. So, as before, we're just going to pick O2 clean. It will load the sample. We hit exit. And now our parameters are loaded. They're going to be identical because it's the same recipe. So, for most users, we only allow them to change the process time. So, to do that, you click on the time itself and it'll give you a process time. You can re-enter it all you want. So, I'm going to say 360, enter. Now the process time is there. We have a couple of other parameters as well. We have gas flows with oxygen, CF4, and a couple of chlorine gases that are not installed in the system. We also have a process pressure as well as ICP and IRE forward power. So next we hit exit and we download the recipe. Now that we're in the recipes and everything's loaded, we can begin running our process. Before we begin though, I want to make a distinction between manual process control and automatic process control. In manual, which is more for experienced users who have had the training, you can change a lot of other parameters, including the gas flows on the fly. But for now, we're going to use the automatic single process, which is going to be the most commonly used for the average user. 
Now we see a chamber status. You're going to see a couple of things happen in a few moments. First, our pressure is going to set to whatever we set it to, so it's going to rise up to 150 and stabilize our gas. Our gas flow is correct as we set it, so we put it at 50 and it's reading at 50. Once this gas stabilizes, we're going to have an IRE power set rise up. Now we have two powers, we have forward and reflective. Forward is what you put in, so suppose we put 100 watts, if we see 100 forward, that means we're going to experience our full 100 watts of power on our sample. Notice how there's a reflective for a few seconds and now it's back to zero. Reflective is more about what power is lost. So if your power is say is 98 forward and two reflected, you're losing essentially two watts of power. And this can affect your etch rate and a couple of other process optimizations that you may have in the past. So it's very important to keep an eye out for these two parameters. Once everything is stabilized, you'll see that the process time begins ticking down. So we have set it at 360 and it's ticking down. Back here we have a couple more parameters. We have helium, which is gonna be the backside cooling on your sample. It's set at about five. And it's going to be, it's, it's pretty typical to see it drop down to 4.9, it's okay. The flow rate should be around 0.2, right now it's 0.3, which is okay. Everything else looks fine, so at this point we're just waiting for the process to finish. This one happens to have two steps, so we're going to see that too, but for now, we wait for the sample to finish. Be mindful of reflective power. A non-zero reflective power can indicate a short in the sample or perhaps a dirty chamber. You might be able to see arcing like here, shown in the video, if the chamber is dirty. Once we finish processing our wafer, it is now time to leave it in a standby mode. To go into standby mode, we click on the standby mode button. This will pump down our load lock to a near vacuum level, especially if you did not pump it down earlier. So if you vented your load lock earlier and forgot to pump it down, it will pump down at this stage. So now we're in standby mode and we're not done yet. We actually have to do one more step. You see, if we leave it in this mode, the pump will keep pumping on the chamber until it reaches an equilibrium point. At this equilibrium point, oil from the pump can actually creep back into the load lock and deposit on the walls. This is bad because the oil can interfere with your etch rates, it can cause contaminate and cause a lot of weird effects to happen. So to prevent this, we want to shut off the pump in a way that leaves the chamber under vacuum. So to do this, we will cancel out of standby mode and then cancel out the ventilation because when you do this, it tries to vent and I'll show you in a second what I mean by that. So we had a venting load lock notification, we canceled immediately right away, and now we're left with a nice chamber that's under vacuum and the pump is no longer pumping. So at this point, our chamber is ready to be left alone and we can leave the tool as it is, it's in safe standby mode. So you might be asking, what does it mean does it with this oil and this back pumping? A good example would be to use a refrigerator. So imagine you have a refrigerator and you plug it in, it gets nice and cold on the inside, then you unplug it, but you leave the door closed. That keeps the refrigerator nice and chilly on the inside without any problems. And you can open it and close it a little bit. You know, it stays relatively cold. Of course, we're not opening our chamber. We're leaving it under vacuum, but that's the kind of analogy. And then when the next person comes, they can plug it back in or turn on the pump again and use the tool like normal. Once we're finished running our process and our samples been successfully unloaded, we'd like all users to log their entries in the logbook. This is our try on logbook. Typically, you'll see uh, username, the group, the date, start time, completion time, the recipe name, anything else related to the recipe, and lastly, comments. These comments are very important to us because these comments can help us figure out if something's being unusual, especially behaviors or etch rates that can be indicative of problems to come in the tool. So we can be preemptive and work on the tool before things get worse. That's the end of our try on video, and I hope you have some good results on our tool. Have a nice day.